Out of Zion, his glory is shown, his perfection is declared to the nations. for this hour set apart for the people of God, we would ask that, that you would guide us, thou great Jehovah. Lord, as you have ga gathered your people together for thousands of years on this first day of the week called the Lord's Day, I pray, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would open our eyes and soften our hearts, that as we sing and confess our sins, as we stand witness to the beautiful sacrament of baptism, and as your word is preached, I pray we would leave here saying, we we have encountered Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would descend upon this place. Would you open, Lord, the floodgates of heaven, so, Lord, that we would see you high and lifted up, that we, we would see you exalted on your throne, and that we would say we've encountered Jesus and our lives would never be the same. We pray all these things in the matchless name of the one who taught his own when they prayed to say, our Father, Chard in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
enter the Christian life through faith in Christ and the repentance of our sins, and that's the way we live the Christian life day to day, by faith in Christ and a life of humble repentance before God. And so as part of our worship service, let us confess our sins together. We'll do so using the prayer of confession that's printed in the bulletin. It's also on the screen. Let's pray this in unison, uh, allowing these words to soften and open our hearts to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Well, let's now bow our heads, close our eyes, and in silence, search our hearts and confess our sins to God. Amen. The psalmist says, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Do you believe that's the gracious God we serve? Have you confessed your sins to him? Then hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
This morning we have the privilege of being witnesses to God's faithfulness from generation to generation as we witness the sacrament of holy baptism. And so I would like to invite the Gunston family. And my, would you join me on top step of the chancel as we celebrate baptism together. All right, follow the boss down there, wherever he says to go. (laughs) By the way, Pastor Andrew and I, we talked last night and we decided gray would be the appropriate color uh, for today. So hopefully everybody enjoys the, 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 the color coordination. All right. Come on out. Yeah, come. All right, so this is the Gunston family. Uh, the Gunston family, longtime members here at Coral Ridge. Uh, Jay and I actually had the privilege of growing up together uh, right across the street at Westminster Academy. So it's an honor uh, to be a part of this special day as you bring your children forward uh, for the sacrament of covenant baptism. I ask you these questions before your family uh, and also before your church family, but also before God as you, in obedience to the scriptures, bring your children forward to receive the sign and the seal of the sacrament of baptism. I ask you, do you acknowledge your children's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises on their behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation as you do your own? And now, do you unreservedly dedicate your children to God? Do you promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you'll endeavor to set before them a godly example, that you'll pray with them and for them, and you'll teach them the doctrines of our holy religion and strive by all the means of God's appointment to raise them in the fear and and the admonition of the Lord, do you? If you call Coral Ridge your church home, do you promise to walk alongside of the Gunston family to encourage them, to point them to Jesus, to let them know that they are for, that you're for them, that you encourage them as they raise these beautiful children, these covenant children, in the fear and admonition of the Lord, do you? Okay. What name has been given this child? Grady J. Grady J. Yeah. Yeah. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, Lord, I thank you for Grady. Lord, I thank you that you brought him into this world through this family. And by all the means of God's providence, Lord, you could have chosen him to be born into any family, but you chose this one to be on this step, on this day, receiving the sign and the seal of the covenant. And so, Lord, I pray that he would grow up in this home and grow up in this church loving you more than the things of this world. And that, Lord, according to your providence, on your, in your sovereign will and in your sovereign timing, that you would bring Grady to a, a relationship with you where he would confess you as his Lord and as his Savior. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome him to the family of God. <laughs> all right. All right. What name has been given this child? Graham. Middle name. Graham Hunter. Graham Hunter Gunston. I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son. And I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for Graham and for his life. Lord, just as we prayed over his brother, Lord, it's according to your providence that you brought him into the Gunston home. And so, Lord, I pray that he would grow up in a home where he would see his parents open up the word of God. They would look to you by faith. They would be quick to confess their sin and quick to confess their, their need for you and for your grace. Lord, I pray that he would grow up in this church and in this community where he would see sinners that have been transformed by the grace of God. And he would want to experience that himself. So we dedicate this child to you, this covenant child. Lord, would you save him? Would you conform him to the image and likeness of Jesus? And it's in his name we pray. 
Amen. Church family, let's welcome him to the family of God. Is he going to play baseball? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Mai, come here. This is Mai. Uh, Mai has an incredible story. Uh, you might recognize Mai. She was one of the many members that, were, that was standing up here last week uh, to be received into the covenant community here at Coral Ridge. Uh, Mai came to the Coral Ridge for the first time at one of our Christmas concert this past year. She saw the nativity at the end of the concert, and she heard the gospel presented at the end of the concert. Two days later, working and talking with her friend to, that brought her to that concert, uh, she committed her life to Jesus Christ. And yeah, it was an awesome thing. Amazing, amazing, amazing story. And now she comes before you, her new church family, uh, making the profession of faith and saying, yes, I believe and I want to receive the sign and the seal of the covenant that I don't belong to this world, but I belong to God. May I ask you these questions? If you, you've got a great group of, of women behind you uh, that love you and are, yeah, let's stand closer to them, yes, <laughs> that love you and are, are praying for you this day. My, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure without hope save in his sovereign mercy, do you? I do. My, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, and do you rest upon him alone for your salvation as he's offered in the gospel, do you? And now do you resolve? You're, make, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> and now do you resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes, Church family, this is a new sister in the Lord. Do you promise to come alongside of her, to encourage her in her new faith, uh, pointing her and to Jesus, that reminding her that he is her only hope in life and in death. Do you? My daughter of Christ, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and I baptize you in the name of the Son, and I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. And Father, oh Lord, how we're rejoicing this day. A daughter has come home. A child has been found. It's a day of rejoicing on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, our, this church family now stands alongside and we covenant with my that we will encourage her. We will point her to Jesus. That we will encourage her in this new faith as she journeys and discovers what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I thank you for these sweet friends that are standing alongside of her today. In particular, we thank you for Beverly. We thank you for her graciousness of inviting my. We thank you for the gospel that goes forth and promises to not return void. I thank you that the word was declared and that the word was received and who used this word, O oh Father to save my, to bring her into the light, out of darkness, rescuing her so that the, her eyes would be opened and her heart would be softened to receive Jesus. I pray that she would know that she has a whole group of people that love her and are for her, but most importantly, may she never forget this day where she was reminded that because of Jesus, the Father, the Heavenly Father, has his favor upon her. It rests upon her now, not according to her goodness or her righteousness or her performance, but on the basis of Jesus' performance for her. And we pray all these things in the matchless name of the one who is mighty to save, even Jesus the Christ. Amen. Church family, let's welcome this dear sister to the family of God. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's respond to that by standing and heartily with one voice, united with God's people through the ages and around the world, confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. of a couple of announcements as we continue in worship together. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Brittany for filling in at the last minute. If you notice your bulletin, we had Pauline singing, Pauline Baxter singing a lot this morning, and she uh, is under the weather. And so at uh, last minute, thank you, Brittany, for uh, responding and uh, for offering your gifts and talents to the Lord today. Also want to make mention of two events that you'll see on the back of your bulletin. Uh, this Wednesday night, we continue our summer seminar series entitled Dominion, Politics, and the Kingdom of God. This is a free seminar every Wednesday night through the summer. You'll notice that it begins at 6.30 p.m. in the DeVos Chapel. This series in particular, Politics and the Kingdom of God, will continue for several more weeks through June 15th. And then we'll start the second part of the seminar, Created to Create Technology and the Christian Life, which will take us all the way through the summer, ending on August the 3rd. Men's Ministry, upcoming event, June 21st, 7 p.m., Top Golf. Great opportunity, uh, not only to show your skills at Top Golf, but most importantly, uh, to enjoy fellowship with the other men in this church. If you're new to Coral Ridge, looking for ways to connect, uh, I encourage you to sign up at crpc.org forward slash men, and you uh, can purchase your ticket online. It begins 7 p.m. on June 21st. Part of the way that we worship is through our tithes and our offerings and giving back to what the Lord has given us. Uh, when you see the story of people giving in the Bible, it's not a story of giving a lot. It's a, about a, the story of giving sacrificially. It's the story of the widow's might, giving all that she had for the glory and the kingdom of God. And so when we do give here, we ask that you would give with a joyful spirit, with a sacrificial heart, knowing that when you give, you partner with us in extending the gospel of God's kingdom to South Florida and beyond it and through it to the world. So would you prayerfully consider as you give today that you would give to the work and to the mission and to the mission and the ministry here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church for the sake of his kingdom, for the glory of God, and for the sake of hundreds of thousands of people to continue to hear the life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, 
also want to thank Rachel for filling in as well. Rachel, always great to have you back and have you home. Uh, one thing I failed to mention in the announcements, uh, I believe uh, we have Gladys Nichols here, who on Thursday turned 102, longtime member of Coral Ridge, all the way in the back there. God bless you, Gladys. God bless you and happy birthday from your Coral Ridge family. Today we conclude our seven-part series that we've entitled Encountering Jesus. And this morning we're going to look at a story of Jesus not encountering one individual, but Jesus encountering two individuals. It's the story of two individuals on the road to Emmaus. It's found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 24 beginning in verse 13, and we'll read through verse 35. It's the tale of two stories. And I want to ask you before we read this, who can relate to the story of your life not going as planned? Who can relate to the story of your life, your family, your career, your children, that story just unfolding not the way you wrote it? Well, the two individuals on the road to Emmaus can relate. And their story intersects with Jesus' story, and their lives will never be the same. Luke 24, beginning as verse 13, this is the very word of God. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. When they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, slow to heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight, and they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those that were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has gathered and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And I pray this morning, as the word is preached, that our hearts would burn, our eyes would be open, because the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. A tale of two stories. In Luke 24, it's Easter Sunday. Cleopas and an individual that is unnamed are traveling back from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. Uh, The context is that this journey to Jerusalem was because of the Passover feast. And they had one story that they had written in their minds. They were going to Jerusalem because they had heard a man by the name of Jesus had entered into Jerusalem to save Israel, to redeem Israel, to reestablish the kingdom of God to Jerusalem, and to rid Jerusalem 
of the evil Romans. And now they're walking back. They're walking back from Jerusalem and they're dejected. They're walking back to, from Jerusalem and they're disillusioned. Why? Because the story that they had written in their minds had been shattered. We were going for victory. We were going for celebration. And the man we thought was going to redeem Israel and restore our hope was hanging on a cross and left for dead in the tomb. It's the tale of two stories. They had written a story of hope and joy and promise of what they would find in Jerusalem only to be experiencing another story, a story of despair and dejection, a story full of shattered dreams. But maybe you can relate because each one of us at some point in our lives have had a story that has been shattered. I had a story that didn't go as planned. And I want to ask you this morning, just as the two individuals that were experiencing the shattered dreams of a story that never panned out, what happens when that story intersects with Jesus' story? I pray this morning that whatever your story is today, whether it is a story of life going exactly as planned or more than likely a story that has not gone anywhere close to what was planned, that you would encounter Jesus afresh this morning and you would see that he is rewriting our stories, redeeming and restoring our journey and offering us hope even in the midst of our brokenness. What is your story this morning it might be one of the most important questions you ask because your story is the narrative that frames your life. Your story is what helps you make sense of life and make sense of this world. And your story, if it does not intersect with Jesus' story, will only be full of despair, unmet expectations, and shattered dreams. Let's look what happens to these two individuals on the road to Emmaus when their story intersects with Jesus' story, a tale of two stories. First thing we see this morning is the pain of our broken story. It's a painful story that we see in the opening verses of Luke 24, beginning in with verse 13. In verse 17, in fact, Jesus, who they don't even know it's Jesus at this point because it had been hidden from them, simply asks them, notices these two, this, these two individuals having this intense conversation more than likely. And he asks them this question, why are you so sad? You can only imagine what they were talking about. The scriptures give us no revelation of what exactly was involved in that conversation, but you can only imagine because you and I have these conversations all the time of what meant life was meant to look like, how our marriages were supposed to pan out, what was supposed to happen to our children and our career and our future and our dreams? Each one of us at some point in our lives look at the story of our lives. And it causes us to be still. And it causes us to be sad. But then Jesus asked them, why are you so sad? What are you talking about? And in verses 19 through 21, they look at Jesus as if he's been absent from the whole conversation of what's happening in the current events. I mean, it's as if they're saying, Jesus, this is all over Facebook and Instagram. Have you not heard that Jesus, the, the one that we had put our faith and hope in, the one that we thought was going to redeem Israel, he was crucified. I mean, they even say, are you the only one that doesn't know what happened in these days? Disillusioned. I love the honesty of verse 21. They say, but we had hoped. We had hoped that he would be the one. And you can underline verse 21 in your Bibles because you can fill in that verse with anything in your life. You could honestly say, we had hoped my marriage would pan out like this. We had hoped my life would pan out like this. We had hoped better for our children. We had hoped better for our career. I had hoped better for my life. Each single one of us can relate to this statement. But we had hoped. It is a story of a broken story. Shattered dreams. Unmet, unmet expectations. We had hoped. Only for it to come crashing down. 
But you'll never really understand the despair of what's happening in Luke 24 unless you understand the story of the Bible. You see, the story of the Bible, which begins in Genesis 1 and 2, tells us the true story of the world. The true story of the world, contrary to the story of our modern culture, is this. That you and I were created by God. That you and I were created for God. And you and I were created to extend his glory to the ends of the earth. Only for that story to come apart at the seams. And from Genesis 3 on, we have been trying to rewrite the story. And the story of our culture, contrary to the true story of the world, is that you and I are evolutionary accidents. That you and I exist for ourselves. That you and I exist for our pleasure and our glory. Only to find a culture and a world absolutely floundering. And we see this cultural story all around. We even see it in a Disney movie. We hear it in the lyrics of Disney songs. Sorry to every little girl in advance. But even the song, Let It Go From Frozen, says this. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. That's not just the lyrics of a Disney tune. That is the anthem of our society. No wrongs, no rights, no rules, time to break free. This is the motto and the anthem of our culture, only to find ourselves floundering and in despair. How many people do you know that are trying to rewrite the story, the story of their lives, only to find themselves in, in utter sadness and in utter despair? And I am here to say, if you are trying to write your story without God and without Jesus and without the hope that is offered to you in the gospel, your story is tragic. And let me say lame. Your story, if it is not in accordance with the story as it's presented, the true story of the world that God has created you, God has created you for him, and that you will never find hope in anywhere else and in anyone else other than the God who provides his son, Jesus Christ, for you. The story that is framing your life better be the story as it's found written in the word of God. And I am here today to tell you, regardless of what your story has been up until this point, there is a better story, a story of hope and redemption, that your story can be restored, even today, through the person of Jesus Christ. And that leads us to the second point. You see, the pain of losing your story is tragic, but there's joy of our story being restored through the person and work of Jesus Christ. The joy of our story being restored begins in verse 25. These two dejected individuals walking by themselves and all of a sudden comes Jesus. And what does Jesus say beginning in verse 25? He criticizes them. Constructive criticism, but criticism nevertheless. And he calls them foolish ones. And he says, oh foolish ones. What does he say in verse 25? You were slow to heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Verse 26 was it not necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, that he should suffer in order to enter into glory? You see, what Jesus is saying to them is your vision of the Messiah is small. That your vision of the Messiah was simply a man who would parade into earthly Jerusalem to destroy and dethrone the Romans, only to set up an earthly temporary kingdom in the city, earthly city of God. But I am here to tell you, that I am the Messiah that has come not for a temporary earthly kingdom. I am the Messiah who has come to establish an everlasting kingdom. And the only way for the glory to be restored, the only way for shalom to be restored to the earth is for the Messiah to suffer. Suffering must precede glory. It's the only way it's possible. Your vision of what your Christ has come to do is small. The only way that you can be reconciled to God, the only way you can experience salvation, the only way you can be reunited and restored to the God that you lost is for the very Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, to suffer and die 
He is saying, my story is so much better and so greater than any story you could have written. But Jesus doesn't stop there, does he? He then continues in verse 27 as he talks about what it means to have a story of redemption, to have our stories restored. He does in verse 27 what, in my opinion, is one of the most profound things that we read in all of Scripture. Jesus takes them back to the law and the prophets. Now, remember, at that time, that's all they had. That was the Scripture. And so what Jesus is doing, he says, beginning with the law and the prophets, he reveals himself to them through the scripture, revealing to the world that the entire story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is ultimately about one figure, that being the person and work of Jesus Christ Every patriarch, every story, every prophet, every psalm, every proverb pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice, Jesus doesn't say, hey guys, it's me. You don't recognize me? Even Jesus uses the word. Do you understand the power of the scriptures? Even Jesus himself says, let me take you to the scripture the powerful, authoritative word of God to understand who I am and what I have come to do. And then notice in verse 30, eventually they walk along the road, the joy of their story being restored by the Messiah. And when they arrive at the home in verse 30, it says they were at the table. Now remember, Jesus is a guest. In this culture, Being a guest and being the host was extremely significant. To be the host was to be in the place of honor. You were controlling the scenario. You were controlling the context. But look what happens in verse 30. It says that when they were at the table, he, meaning Jesus, broke the bread or took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. The guest becomes the host. And the only way any individual would have the audacity to become the host as a welcome guest, the only explanation is if that one had authority and a sovereignty over the other individuals at the table. And God uses both the word of God revealed to those individuals and the authority that is exerted over them at the table to finally reveal who he is. It says finally in verse 31 and 32 that their eyes were open, that their joy was restored, and they say, weren't our hearts burning as he talked about himself in the scriptures. Confusion is gone. The fog is finally dissipating. And their story is being restored. I don't know if you hear a single thing that I've said this morning, but I want you to hear this. I want to dare you this morning that regardless of what your story has been up until this point, I dare you to believe that Jesus has the power to redeem and restore your story. I dare you to believe that Jesus has enough authority and enough grace, no matter how far you have gone, no matter what the story and narrative of your life has been up until this point, I dare you to believe that Jesus has the power to redeem and restore, yes, even your story this morning. So what happened? What happened to these two individuals? And what are the implications for us this morning? I want to leave you just with a few points of application this morning of what happens when Jesus' story intersects with our story. Well, the first point of application is they receive courage. These individuals, you understand what was happening historically. Every person that was following Jesus was running for their lives. I mean, you have a story of two individuals that were walking back from Jerusalem with no intention of returning. 
I mean, I mean, Jerusalem was like Kiev. I mean, you don't go back into the fire. You don't go back into the, the, the place where they are sacrificing and murdering and persecuting Christians. I mean, the, the whole narrative of Christianity in those first few days after Jesus dies is run and hide. Save your life. But was it as, what does it say? It says in verse 33, they respond with a fearlessness that can only be explained by the transformation of the word of God as it's revealed by Jesus himself. And verse 33, in the midst of fear, in the midst of people running for their lives, it says in the same hour they returned to Jerusalem. They said, we're going back into the fire. We're going back in. It's the only explanation. See, Jesus had encountered them in their moment of despair, in the midst of their broken story. And when their story was restored and hope was restored to two people that were full of despair, they said, we are filled now with a courage that can only come from Almighty God. Two individuals here encounter Jesus and they run right back into the fire, risking everything. It gives us fearlessness, a fearlessness of spirit, and a resolve to remain courageous. The second thing that we see here is clarity. The confusion is gone in a moment. It says their eyes were open. You see, when we truly encounter Jesus through his word, we're able to say, I know who I am. I know what I'm here for, and I know where I'm going. You cannot listen to me. You can't put a price tag on that. To be able to wake up every day with clarity and say, I know who God is and I know where I've come from and I know who I've been made for and I know where I'm going. When you encounter Jesus, there's clarity in the absence of confusion. And third and lastly, there's passion. There's passion for his word. It says, weren't our hearts burning? That idea of hearts burning is synonymous with the work of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the living God is likened to a fire. And when we encounter Jesus in his word, it is like a fire going off within us. This is the power of the word of God. That is why this church is centered on the word of God. That's why you bring your Bibles on Sunday morning. That's why we preach from the word of God. And don't tell nice stories about what Rob did this past week. It's why I encourage you to come to Bible study and that you immerse yourself in the word and meditate on it day and night so that there would be a burning, a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. When you neglect God's word, you can expect confusion. And the fog of life, darkness and emptiness. But when you immerse your life and your mind and your soul in the very word of God, there is light and there is hope and there is a passion for the things of God. I want to ask you this morning, regardless of your story, regardless of where you're at today, do you know this one? This Jesus who came into the world came into the world to save us and to redeem our broken story by taking on our sin and our unrighteousness and by faith alone, restoring us to our Father simply by believing in him. I want to ask you, do you know this one? Because until you know this one and confess him as Lord and as Savior, your story will never make sense. And you will continually go through the fog and the storms of life with confusion and being disillusioned and full of unmet expectations. But when you encounter Jesus and you surrender your life to him, the light goes off, the coin drops, and now you can see clearly for the very first time, do you know him? Story transformed but this great storyteller who comes into the world to save broken sinners like you and like me. In 2011, a task force was appointed by the Department of Justice to fight against gender discrimination globally. They went to the nation of India, who suffers greatly from, uh, who suffers greatly from fighting gender uh, fighting, uh, fighting against uh, gender and fighting against the displacement of thousands of women that have been displaced and disregarded. 
in the nation of Israel in particular, those girls that are born to families that uh, those girls are not wanted. Uh, they are literally given the name Nakusha, which literally means unwanted. Can you imagine growing up in a home and in a culture telling that story that I'm unwanted by my family, so unwanted that this is my name, that this is my identity? Well, this task force had an idea in 2011, they would go from village to village in throughout India, and they would do what is known as renaming ceremonies. They would give hundreds of girls an opportunity to rename themselves, to restore their dignity, to restore their identity. One day in 2011, 310 girls showed up to receive a new name. Girls that had been given the name Nakusha, Girls that have been given the name unwanted, wanting to redeem their story, wanting to redeem their names. After the ceremony was ended, one 16-year-old girl confided in one of the journalists that I had secretly converted to Christianity, but I want to tell my story today. Yes, I was born as Nakusha, unwanted, but I've given myself the name Grace. What a story. Growing up in a home and in a culture, being told that you are unwanted, but in a moment, redeeming your name through the power of Jesus Christ, a new story that is written in that girl's life, and now being known by the very grace of Jesus Christ that redeems her story and restores her hope. But if you're found in Jesus Christ this morning, that is your story. The story of one who has redeemed you and restored you. Through Jesus Christ and him alone, he has given you a new name. He has given you the name Christian, a son and a daughter of God, that yes, you were once unwanted because of your sin and separated from God, but because of Jesus Christ and him alone, he redeems your story. He gives you a new narrative. He gives you a new name. He gives you hope in the midst of tragedy. You might be here this morning and saying, but pastor, you don't know my story. Listen to me, I'm sure it's far worse than you'd even care to admit, but that is exactly what qualifies you. It's the story of broken sinners, acknowledging their brokenness, acknowledging their sin, and acknowledging Jesus Christ as their only hope of redemption. So would you come to him today? Would you surrender to Jesus and allow him to rewrite and redeem and restore your story, a story that be can begin today and last forever, because that's what happens when Jesus enters in. The storyteller gives you your story back. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, I pray, if there's anyone here this morning that has been going through their lives, full of despair, empty, wondering, is this as good as it gets? Is this really the story of, of my life that I need to settle with? Help those individuals here this morning and those watching at home to acknowledge this this morning, that we've lost the true story. But we've been trying ever since to create our own story. But deep down in everyone's soul, there's a longing for a better story to be written. One that we long for. But because of our sin, we've been trying to cover ourselves with fig leaves. But I pray that we would discover this morning through the power of your word and through the power of the Holy Spirit that we would acknowledge maybe for the first time, God, I know I've been made by you. I know I've been made for you. And by your grace, I know that only life and life to the full can be found in you. I confess my sins. I acknowledge you as my Lord. I receive you as Savior. Transform my broken story and give me a new story of hope and redemption and life to the full, both now and forever, I look to you, Jesus, by faith alone today. Rewrite my story and give me a new name so that I might believe. And as the scriptures promise, he who believes, God will give them the right to be called a child of God. New stories are being written this morning. 
for those that place their faith, not in themselves, but look to Jesus alone. May hundreds of testimonies come out of this place because of the work of your spirit and the good news of your gospel that redeems us and gives us bright hope, both now and forevermore. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, or maybe you want to discover what it means to have a new story, to have the story that Jesus has come to live and die and be raised for you, then I would encourage you to not leave this place today without talking to someone. There will be leaders, members of our prayer team, and pastors in the narthex that would love the opportunity to pray with you and for you as you begin that new journey of following Jesus Christ. We just stand for the benediction of God this morning and remain standing as we sing of our blessed assurance. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.